On today's world premiere ear snack, we're talking about Richard the Birdman Speck, who killed eight nurses all in one evening and went on to grow boobs and collect birds in prison. That story and more today on Two Murder Morons. This podcast includes graphic depictions of murders and murder scenes. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce comedy while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. My name is Andy. Over here is my buddy, Mike. Hello, everybody. (laughs) What's up? I'm Mike. Hey, I'm Mike. (laughs) Welcome to Two Murder Morons. This is our first episode. First. First ever episode. First ever. I'm so excited, man, to get this going. I'm ready. Uh, So we've recorded a trailer, which has some screw-ups in it. Yeah, it's all right. And we've already got a bonus episode up. Yep. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. What do you think about that one? I think we did pretty good with that. Yeah, yeah. I think it got the ball rolling for us to... And it, it seems so easy. It's... <laughs> it really did, honestly. I know. I Like, I went into it, like, really nervous, I, you I know. know. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, you've been here for, like, three years doing it. I have not been doing this for three years. I know, years. I know, but, you know, it kind of feels that way. I I get it, I guess. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I, I was more nervous for the... The technical stuff. I mean, there's a lot of crap going on here, yeah. and I was like, "Is this going to get messed up?" And you yeah, know, I'm like scared. you know, like my dog currently pulling on my dude. Well, a little technical difficulties with the uh, Jack, yeah. right, Jack down there. Jack down here, he wasn't chewing on it. He just was all wrapped up in my headphone. Did you see it pulling my? Yeah, I know. My head is like. I think it was pretty funny. Uh, yeah. Now, but, see what I was worried about with our episode. You know, doing these things is trying to figure out what to say because we're kind of ad libbing, and I was kind of afraid maybe you know we wouldn't have content. I think we did pretty good with it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Like, you know, I think you and I just just to give everybody some background, Mike and I have been friends for uh, uh, fifteen years plus. Yeah, it has to be close to that. Close yeah. to that. So, uh, and we've always been good buddies, and and I think we have a good. Good rapport. Good, yeah, good yeah. back and forth, and, and we're good at giving each other shit and Exactly. It, <laughs> That's why we're here. Exactly, right? <laughs> so my goal with this was to organize this and not let you know anything yeah. and try to make you look like a complete f***ing idiot. Every That's time all right, though, because it's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> In this aspect. it's Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, when you ask me, hey, what are we doing? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> No, what are we? You, at least you know what we're talking about today. I do because we've kind of made a big deal of planning our first episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a little uh, an idiot in the first couple of you. You were not an idiot whatsoever. Uh, you know, I just I was new coming into this at a, off vacation. But see, I part of that is I. I that's what I think. <laughs> that's why I laugh. I know it's different when you know the people doing yeah. a show like this because you get their personality and you get, you know, the little jokes and the eye roll, yeah. you know, like it's funnier to you. But like I, to me, I don't know about, I don't know about everybody else that watched or listened to this, but like for me that added to it was, was the fact that like you didn't know what was coming. Yeah. You didn't know what I was going to ask you. Yeah. And like the wheel of death stuff. And I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, holy. And you're like, oh. Yeah, did you build that? Shit, yeah, like, I was like, shit, man. Like, no, that's just Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Pretty cool though. But um, yeah, so oh, now because we kind of brought it up, it's a good time. You know, if you are listening to this show right now, wherever you find podcasts, whether you're on Apple Podcasts or whatever, do know that there is a video version. I mean, this is a video podcast. Yes. First. Yes. Um, so if you're just listening to this somewhere, just know that if you want to see. You what? know, our sexy... Yeah, you want to see some grown men look like, you know. <laughs> some people are going to like, oh, I'm going to switch over and then be like, oh. Yeah, let's uh, go back to the uh, audio. <laughs> you just go back to the audio version as we're driving to work. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> I don't need to I don't need to see them. <laughs> but um, no, there are visions. You know, we're, we're do- it's a true crime podcast. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, we've incorporated a lot of 
um, visuals, you know, pictures of the people we're talking about, sometimes yep. some crime scene photos and stuff like that. So uh, if you are listening and you're in the kind of position where you could watch it, um, Spotify, YouTube, those are the two places we upload the video of this podcast. So if you want to see all, see us and see what we're talking about, um, Spotify, YouTube. Yep. And it's pretty simple, you know, everywhere we're two murder morons. So just yeah. search for two murder morons on YouTube or Spotify and, and you'll find us. Yep. And likewise, flip side way, flip side way, flip side, the flip, flip side, the flip side of that. Yeah. If you're watching us right now and prefer to listen because say the only time you have is your drive to work or whatever, yeah. we are available anywhere podcasts are, are found. So yep. we're on pretty much every major platform. So you can find us there. Um, we also want to thank our new executive producers. Oh, yeah. We have a couple new executive producers for the show. Oh, we do? Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> a, I didn't know we promoted somebody. Is, is this who, who do we hire? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, these are our Buy Me a Coffee members. Oh, okay. That, All uh, right. that we're thanking. And we have two. Oh, okay. Which is great to start out with two for our Good. first episode. Shoot, but, I wasn't uh, expecting that. <laughs> but uh, Cheryl, Amy. Oh, okay. Cheryl and Amy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys Thank for you. Thank you. being executive producers and uh, yeah. being our first Buy Me a Coffee members. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So, Keep um, buying. yeah. If, uh, if you're interested in being an executive producer, um, buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons or follow the QR code on your screen, which do we need to explain QR code? No, no, we're good. Okay. We got to figure it out. <laughs> Work it out. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, that's that's where you're going to find all of our bonus episodes, um, and you get you know depending on the tier, there's also little benefits like your name on the screen at the beginning of the show and yep. on our website and all that good stuff. So uh, again, buymeacoffee.com/slash/two-murder-morons if you're wanting to support us. Yep. Or if you want to support us, we have merch. We do have merch. merch Actually, guys. I'm wearing checking the hat. The hat. Checking the hat. Got the hat. He's got the hat. He's got the hat on. The hat is special. So it's a trucker hat, the good kind. <laughs> it is. I love yeah, that. I really is. do like. I really like how they turned out. Yep. a lot. So if you want a hat of your own, yep. to murdermorons dot com, we have our own website. You can ask, actually listen to episodes there too as well. But mm-hmm. um, there is a merch shop there, and we've got t shirts. We got hoodies. Well, I'm, yep, you got the hoodie. I'm wearing a hoodie. Yep, I you got the t shirt really last time. You. Have the t shirt last time. Got the hoodie this time. Yep. Uh, and what's cool about it is. You know, not only obviously buying something from us helps support, but it also helps us spread the word because yeah. I've already had twice now, like I've only been wearing our merch a week or yeah. so. Yeah. And like twice at either the gas station and I think one other place, someone has stopped me and been like, oh, it's, I see it says true crime pot. Like, what is that? You know, so I, I got to explain, yeah. you know, it's a little different because I got to be like, well, it's, you know, oh, I'm in it. You yeah. know, I'm one of oh, the, yeah. I'm the man. one of the hosts. I'm the man. So, <laughs> yeah. No, I got this young guy. I got this other guy working with me. Not young, but I got this other guy. He's a, he's a yeah, fill-in. Right? Yeah, yeah, he just kind of sits. He he's, sits there. He's, he's, kinda, he's kinda like Ed McMahon. He's replaceable with any other moron I can yeah, find. Yeah, yeah, No, not – Mike, you are irreplaceable. I know. I, I know promise that, you. Truly. I promise you. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, two mortar mor- – I'm going to do that every time. Every time. It's not mortar and it's not Mormon. It's two murder morons. Yep. Dot com. Say that ten times fast. Yep. It sucks. That's why I let you do it. <laughs> That's why you're the hype man. Yeah. That's yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Who are we talking about today? Do you remember? Can you guess who this little guy is? Well, you know. That's not really fair because you know. No, they don't really know. It's, I mean. Well, I mean, you know. I know, but I don't know if they know. Yeah. So this is Richard Speck. Peck. Yes. He is a very interesting individual. Yep. Um, committed his crimes in the 60s in Chicago. Um, and that's who we're going to talk about today. So what do you think? Should we just, you ready to dive? Dive. You ready to dive right yeah, into this jump sucker? jump into it. Let's go. Okay. See where it gets us. All right. So on the screen, this is, I'm not sure how old he is. I'd say he looks probably Let's about five. No. Oh, well, you'll learn that, I think. Okay. Seven. Seven. Nine. Eight. Seven to nine. Yeah. All right. Well, this is, this is a little Richard. Uh, he's born in uh, Kirkwood, Illinois in 1941. And he's the seventh of eight children wow. to Benjamin Franklin Speck. Wow, Benjamin and, Franklin. And Mary Margaret Carball. Mary Margaret. Mary Margaret. Benjamin Franklin, Mary Margaret. Wow, that's some uh, 
colonial names there. I know. We're kicking it old school. Yeah. Uh, so the family moves to Monmouth, Illinois, shortly okay. after Speck's birth. He and his sister Carolyn were much younger than their four older sisters and two older brothers. His mother was religious and a teetotaler. Ah. Do we yeah. know what a teetotaler is? Yeah, it doesn't drink. Nice man. See, we are we're always talking about the generation gap. Yes. I had no I had to like Google what what the hell is a teetotaler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not a drinker. And you're like, boom, that's yeah. what it means. Exactly. Yeah. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Um to reference that, I am ten years older, so almost roughly ten years older than Andy. So But I feel like I'm catching up. Oh, you are. Like quickly. Yeah, yeah. 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 So when he was playing with toys, I was out of toys. Right. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. So All right. So go. Richard's father, he worked as a packer at Western Stoneware in Monmouth, Ooh. having previously worked as a farmer and a logger. In 1947, when Speck was six years old, his father died from a heart attack at the age of 53. Holy cow. I'm 53. No, I'm 54. Am I 53 or am I 54? Shit, I don't. Can't. I remember. thought you were 53. I might be until November. I can't remember. I'll have to thank you. <laughs> That's part of the that's part of the age that's part thing. Of the age thing. Yeah, it's like, going. Yeah. All so, right. so Spec was reportedly very close to his father. So obviously, you can see we're already setting the setting the uh, pattern. Yeah, setting the serial killer pattern here. Yep. Um, on May tenth, nineteen fifty, three years after the death of his father, his mother Mary married Carl August Rudolph Lindbergh. How's that for a name? Wow. Is he related to the Limbergs? I don't believe so. Okay. I feel like this would have been a much bigger story if he was. Probably. Um, but yeah, say, that's another thing. Say 10 times fast. Yeah. Carl just, August Rudolph Lindbergh. Why they had so many? I mean, that's such a... Why? The names? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, what, uh, why can't it just be Michael, David, or Douglas, or whatever, you know? Right. No, why, you got, have, why have four... Stanley, Robert, Did they Michael. name him after Grandpa... They might have like the grandfather on both sides, or I mean, they might have. I don't know. And then the dad. Maybe someone could leave in comments. Yeah, of yeah. This, you yeah, know. that might know why if, guys if you, have four. Yeah, names. Like, is it a, is it a generational thing? Is it just yeah, that don't we don't do it much anymore? Or? I don't know because none of my dads, you know, they're was never like that. They're from the early 1900s and all that. True. Maybe it's like a cultural, like certain could background, be, like could be, German could be. background or so. I don't, you know, I don't could know. Could be, yep. So anywho, uh, she and Lindbergh had met during a train ride to Chicago. Lindbergh was tra- a traveling insurance salesman from Texas okay. with a 25-year criminal record that ranged from forgery and several DUIs. Lindbergh was also a hard drinker, and unlike Spe- which is unlike Speck's father. So remember his... This is kind of weird. How did they end up? You got mom yeah. who's a teetotaler. Teetotaler. And does it, yeah. And ends up with an alcoholic. I don't really know how that works. Well, she probably, I mean, she had a few kids she had to take care of, so. True. And, you know, I guess the death of her yeah. first husband may have messed her up. I, I can see that true, happening. True. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Speck and his sister, Carolyn, the two little ones, they stayed with their married sister, Sarah Thornton in Monmouth for a few months so Speck could finish second grade before joining their mother in Lindbergh in rural Santo, Texas. Oh, wow. That's so, a change. Yeah, like rural Illinois to Santo, Texas. Yeah, I bet that's pretty... I don't know anything about Santo, Texas, but it sounds like it's a population of 500 maybe. Yeah, I, and I'm not sure it is. Um, so it's 40 miles west of Fort Worth. Okay. Is is where Santo is located at. Um, and that's where Speck begins to attend the third grade. Oh, okay. So in 1952, Speck's eldest brother, Robert, dies in an automobile accident. So you got his father passing away. Yep, lost dad, lost brother. He's lost brother. We're, we're just in the, setting it up to knock it down, aren't yeah, we? And the alcoholic stepfather. Yep, who's a who's a criminal? So he's, he's a criminal. Yep, he's witnessing all this this crap, you know. Yep. So let's move. Here's a new. So he's gonna, you know, obviously begin. Yeah, down yeah, his early, path early. Because he's probably what. He's got to be high school age right there, probably. Yeah, he's. I think he's young, and I think we talk about. I don't know if I have his age for his first crime, but I might mention it here in a second. He looks about about fifty, probably sixteen, maybe. Yeah, he's young. Yeah. But uh, so 19, we're in 1951 now, okay? okay? Um, after a year in Santo, Specht moved with his mother, 
Lindbergh, and sister Carolyn to East Dallas. Okay. The family moved frequently, living at 10 different addresses and usually Jesus. poor neighborhoods over the next 12 years. So, again, we're just setting up. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, growing up in the environment. Like, I know that the, the the moving may not be that weird, but I just can't, moving, I can't imagine moving, like, once a year, every year for 10 years. Yeah, you know, like, you yeah, you start to get a friend, and then next thing you know, hey, what well, we're gone. Right. So you're kind of getting that loner. Yeah, and, and then not, back then, it's not like you could, you know, send him an email or, you know. Right. <laughs> you could correspond by mail, <laughs> right. you know. You couldn't, like, text him. Yeah, or call. Like, or, I mean, <laughs> if you called him, you're on the party line, and somebody, right. you know, you got four people listening to you. And you got mom at 10 that's like, it's yeah. bedtime, hang yeah, up the phone. Hang up the phone. <laughs> that's so weird. You know. So Speck loathed his stepfather. Bet. Hate of the guy. I wonder why. Said he was often drunk, verbally abusive, and frequently absent. Great, great dude. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Stand up man. So Speck struggles in school. Of course. He refuses to wear the glasses that he needed for reading. Mm -hmm. He repeated the eighth grade at JL Long Junior High School, in part because of his fear of people staring at him. Weird fair. Well, I don't like people staring at me, but, yeah, but to have an actual like fear. Yeah, it's kind of different. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and apparently he also would refuse to speak in class. So he, I can already tell you, he's the weird kid. Yeah. You know, like if I'm going to that school, like who's this kid? He doesn't talk. He, he doesn't read any of his sign, you know. Yeah. He's kind of the odd man out. He's got a, some, he's got some mental issues going on. Yeah, big time. And I understand why. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the autumn of 1957, Speck started ninth grade at Crozier Technical High School, okay. but failed every single subject. Speck did not return for the second semester, dropping out of school in January of 1958 after his 16th birthday. Wow. Having started drinking alcohol at the age of 12... Okay, well, you know, his stepfather brought it in the home, so... True, but I just... I I can't imagine a drunk 12-year-old. It's crazy. I mean, I well, know it's back, out there. Back there, it's different. I mean, you think about it, be, I mean... Probably before the 1900s, what did you have to drink out there for families? Water, milk, and some kind of liquor. And, and whiskey. Yeah, and um, I'm sure a lot of kids drank. That's true. I mean, I guess 12, you're pretty close to your third. I mean, uh, you're almost a teenager. That's yeah. not that out of the question, but still. I mean, people are getting married at 14. True, that's true. <laughs> well, by age 15, he's getting drunk every day. Yeah, great. So 12, he starts drinking. By 15, he's just drunk every day. Every day. Okay. Yep. So he's setting it up. His first arrest, which I don't know if this is the mugshot from the first arrest. It might be because he looks actually a little bit older. Yeah. Um, but his first arrest in 1955 at age 13 for trespassing was okay. followed by dozens of other arrests for misdemeanors over the next eight years. Hmm. So he's uh, he's turned into that. Yeah. Yeah. Career criminal. Starting it. Starting yeah. out, yeah. He's starting it. From 1960 to 1963, Speck worked as a laborer for the 7-Up Bottling Company in Dallas. That's a good job. I know, right? It's, it's probably union. Yeah. Well, I don't, back then? Uh, yeah, I bet it was back then, probably. Um, but yeah, that's got to be a good... Good pay, I would think. 7-Up. Yeah, 7-Up, big, big company. Yeah. yeah, especially back then. Um, in October of 61, Speck met 15-year-old Shirley Annette Malone at the Texas State Fair. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She became pregnant after three weeks of dating. Yep. <laughs> I mean, like, Hello. go Richard. Yep. <laughs> but he's got a good job. He's got a good job. Yep. He, he's working. Yep. Uh, but he's drinking. She, he's drinking quite a bit. He's yep. drunk every day at this point, supposedly. Yep. 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 And he's starting the criminal issue, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's got a bonus. Right. <laughs> The couple married on January 19th, 1962, okay. and initially moved in with his sister, Carolyn, and her husband. Okay. Speck's mother lived there as well, having wow. separated from Lindbergh. So smart. About time. Smart. Long enough. And Lindbergh's now living in California. Oh. He's living the, the single dude life. Yeah. Living up on the beach. Speck stopped using the name Richard Benjamin Lindbergh when he got married and went back to using Richard Benjamin Speck. Okay. Hated his stepfather. Yeah, I, I get it. Do you? We don't do that nowadays, do we? Like, Not unless she adopts you. Yeah, which there was no mention of that. Yeah, so that's usually the only way. 
Yeah. It's weird that he had, unless, unless mom was insistent or Could something be, like that. the Times didn't want to. Give the appearance that yeah. she'd been. Yeah, but he, she's a widow. It's not like they yeah, were divorced or. I don't know. Those times were weird. The way they looked at things. Yeah, true. Who knows? Speck's daughter, Robbie Lynn Speck, was born July 5th, 1962. Oh. While Speck was serving a 22-day jail sentence for disturbing the peace after a drunken melee in McKinney, Texas. At least he wasn't there for the birth. That's right. good. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Way to go, jackass. Way to go. Looks like every birthday coming up, he's going to miss. Right. In July of 1963, at the age of 21, Speck was sentenced to serve three years in prison after being convicted of forgery and burglary. Speck had forged and cashed a co-worker's $44 paycheck, which in today's money would be $421. Okay. And also robbed a grocery store for cigarettes, beer, and $3 in cash, which is equivalent to $29. So he got cigarettes, beer, and 29 bucks, and he ends up getting three years in prison for that. Wow. He was paroled in 1965 after serving 16, 16 months at Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville. His release lasted, any guess on how long? 24 hours. Uh, a week. He okay. made it, at least okay. he made it a week. Okay. Well, you never know. Uh, he was maybe a, he needed some cigarettes and beer again. Right. <laughs> well, he's arrested again on January 9th, 1965. Because he attacked a woman in the parking lot of her apartment building Here wielding we a 17 inch carving knife. The start of the rapist. But fled when the woman screamed. The police arrived within minutes and apprehended Speck a few blocks away. Mm-hmm. He's convicted of aggravated assault, given a 16 month sentence to run concurrently with a parole violation sentence, and he's returned to prison in Huntsville. Wow. Yeah, you know, he's. He, it, it's funny how you watch him just. You know, it, start, it started with trespassing, yeah, and then, yeah. And then we get into like a little minor theft yeah. stuff, like you know. And now we're attacking women with giant carving knives. Yep. Uh, due to an error, he was released just six months later upon the completion of his parole violation sentence. Error was he yeah. wrongfully released? released? Yeah, basically, he was supposed to serve them concurrently, mm. and something got mixed up because basically, when the sentence for his parole violation ended, they released him, not realizing he had more time to go from the ag assault. Whoops! Some, yeah, somebody got fired. Yeah, some probably a couple people. Probably. Yeah. Uh, after his release, Speck worked for three months as a driver for the Patterson Meat Company. Okay. Which I always thought this kind of stuff was weird because you see more than one killer who works as a butcher at some True. point. Yeah. So like I, I thought that was like, is is he getting a taste of what it's like? It could be. Uh yeah. Yeah. Plus he's got that. I mean he's got the he's got the facility for it. That's true. That's true. Mm. So <laughs> even though he had six accidents in the company's truck, Jesus. He was fired for failing to show up for work. Pretty strict back then. Oh yeah, there was there was no yeah, excuse. Yeah, no I mean, sick you, days. Uh, they didn't give a shit if your mom died. Yeah, you, I mean, yeah. You're, oh, you're five minutes late. You're fired. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Your kid was born. Who gives? A shit? Yeah, mom why weren't too. you here? Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. I wasn't there for my kid. Well, you know, I was yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, in December of '65, upon recommendation of his mother, Speck, mo- Speck moved in with a 29 year old divorced woman, who was an ex professional wrestler, and is now a bartender at his favorite bar. Oh. Now, that's classy. Right. I mean, if you're going to pick a wife or some woman to live with, it should be a wrestler. Wrestler and current, and now yes. bartender. And a bartender. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the type of roommate you need. Exactly. Um, and, he, and basically, he's paying rent by babysitting her three children. Oh, lovely. Right. <laughs> if mm. only she knew. Yeah. Uh, in, Stranger danger. Yeah. <laughs> mommy. <laughs> In January of 1966, Malone, who's this woman's name, who had been separated. Oh, I'm sorry. Malone is his wife, soon to be ex. Okay. Uh, Malone, who had been separated from Speck, filed for divorce. The same month, Speck stabbed a man uh, with a knife, or I'm sorry, Speck stabbed a man in a knife fight at Jenny's Lounge, where this girl's a bartender. Okay. He was charged with aggravated assault, but a defense attorney hired by his mother got the charge reduced to disturbing the peace. How do you stab somebody? I mean, I know this stuff happens today. Yeah. So he stabs a dude with a knife in a bar fight, and somehow they're like, eh, eh, disturbing the pieces. The pieces. Yeah, it's more fitting. That, that'll work. Hmm. Um, it's kind of... So for that, he's fined 
ten dollars, ninety dollars in today's money, and jailed for three days after he failed to pay the fine. So, <laughs> oh great. So let's so, get into this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we're not going to pay the fine. You you got the background. You know, you got that one incident that they screwed up on and released him. You would think they might want to pick him up on that. Right. He's got a concurrent sentence out there he's never finished. Right. Like, is there not a warrant for, or maybe back then they were like, eh, yeah, close well. enough. We got the money out of him. But I'm just saying we went from stabbing a dude, mm-hmm. which could kill him, to it's disturbing the peace. So you're getting off, you should know you're getting off easy with that. Oh, one. yeah, yeah. And all you get is a $10 fine and then you don't f- pay it. Yep. What are they going to do? Well, they put you in jail for three days, apparently. Oh, that's not bad. Big whoop, oh, right? Boy. Uh, this is the last Especially time. Especially with his background. True. Which I'm thinking about it, though. Like, we're always talking about technology. Like, what would the police have... Like, I feel like back in the 60s, you know, if you commit a crime in Cincinnati... They're not going to know about it. And then you go to Cleveland, how do... They don't know what mm-hmm. you've done. And Yeah. I, I mean, maybe there was something... I don't think that so. That the feds would put out? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This would mark the last time Speck is in police custody in Dallas. Okay. So it's the last time Texas has to deal with this ass. March 5th, 1966. Speck bought a 12-year-old car. Then he robbed a grocery store the following evening, stealing 70 cartons of cigarettes, which oh. he then sold out of the trunk of his car in the grocery store's parking lot. This takes this takes some thought. Yeah. Right? Hello. The police I traced... Mean, well, at least it went two blocks away. <laughs> right. You know, shit. At least go to another grocery yeah, store yeah. or something. Mm. Uh, but police traced the car, which Speck had abandoned at one point, and issued a warrant for his arrest for burglary on March 8th. He had been apprehended under that warrant, or had he been apprehended under that warrant, it would have been his 42nd arrest in Dallas. Jesus Christ. Now, I know they're keeping track of their own Oh, of course. Like, yeah. at this point, no one's like, this is 42. I mean, I guess what can you do, though, if it's all kind of petty crime? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not enough to put him away for life. The point of this, though, is everyone's saying, surely this would have resulted in a prison term. Yeah, you would think so. If he would have been caught for yeah. this one. And surprisingly, Texas, too, because they're usually... I'm, I'm surprised they didn't hang him over yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. You know? Especially when he went to tag that woman. Uh, March 9th, 1966, Speck's sister Carolyn drove him to Dallas, the Dallas bus depot, where he took a bus to Chicago. Okay. So he's kind of, I would say, fleeing. Yep, get on that dollar bus. Because at this point, he's got to know he's wanted. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. In Dallas, yeah. you know. Yeah. So he, he had... He, he, could, he could leave and it's not going to pop up anywhere because they don't have... Exactly. Any way to do that. Right. Like, we do now. Yeah. So, uh... Speck stays with his sister Martha and her family in Chicago for a few days, and then he returned to his bo- boyhood home of Monmouth, Illinois, okay. where he initially stayed with some old family friends. So just for reference here, if no one knows where Monmouth is, that's where it's at in relation yeah, to... just west of Chicago. To well, Chicago. Southwest of Chicago. Yeah. But kind of out there. I mean, it's not like... Yeah, especially back then. Yeah. Because that would have been pretty much like all country. Yeah, I would think. Well, a small town. Yeah. Surrounded by farmers is what I'm assuming. Pretty pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Speck's brother, Howard, was a carpenter in Monmouth and found a job for Speck sanding plasterboard for another carpenter. Speck became angry when he learned his ex-wife had remarried two days after she was granted the divorce on March 16th, 1966. I know at that point. Yeah. yeah, Jealousy. I guess. Yeah. He should have. Should have f***ed up. Speck moves to the Christie Hotel in downtown Monmouth, which I'm sure is that says a lot right place. there. Yep, that sex offender motel. I was going to say where all the sex offenders probably. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you want a room for the hour, or right. are you staying for the week? <laughs> <laughs> Just get a copy of your driver's license. Um, and he and Speck spends you know after moving to the hotel, he spends most of his time in downtown taverns. Yeah, of course he's yeah. drunk. At the end of March, while Speck and some acquaintances were on a bar hopping trip to Gulfport, Illinois. They were detained overnight by police after Speck reportedly threatened a man in a tavern restroom with his knife. Oh. So here we go with the knife. Yep. So, I mean, it's his, that's his choice. Go, that's his go-to. Yeah. Well, it's, it's better than a gun. Gun's, gun, gun's going to get you in jail. Right. Well, and a gun's going to 
you hear the gunshot. You yeah. Know, a lot of people, you're announcing that you're doing something. True. I get it. But yeah, yeah, knife back then, especially too. Yeah. Knife's not as uh, severe. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so now we go to April 3rd. Miss Virgil Harris, a 65 year old resident of Monmouth. Okay. Returns home at 1 a.m. to find a burglar in her house mm-hmm. brandishing a knife. Yep. She describes him as a six foot tall white man who was, quote, very polite. Okay. And spoke very softly with a southern draw. Oh. The man blindfolded her, tied her up, raped her, okay. ransacked her house, and stole the $2.50 she had earned babysitting for the evening. So this poor, <laughs> this poor little old lady goes to make 2 bucks and 50 cents babysitting. Gets raped. And this is what and she robbed. comes home to. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. A week later... Mary Catherine Pierce, a 32-year-old barmaid who worked at her brother-in-law's tavern, Frank's Place, in downtown Monmouth, Frank's was place. last seen leaving the tavern at 12.20 a.m. on April 9th. She was reported missing on April 13th, and her body was found that day in an empty hog house behind the tavern. She had died from a blow to her abdomen that ruptured her liver. So someone had punched her in the gut real freaking hard. Yeah, with a baseball bat. So, yeah. I don't think a punch would do it. I know. If I, I feel like it would take a lot to yeah. rupture someone's liver. They're lucky they found her. I'm surprised they found her so close. Yeah. Because by by my everything I researched, like this hog house thing is like literally in the backyard of the tavern. So it's like on Main oh, okay. Street. Wow. You know, it's not like she's out at some farm. Yeah. You know, out she's like nowhere. She's downtown. Which, I mean, they found her the same day she was reported missing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Speck, he had frequented Frank's place, um, and the empty hog house was one of several that he had helped build in the preceding month. Okay. So Monmouth police briefly questioned him about Pierce's death when he showed up to collect his final carpentry paycheck on April 15th, and they asked him to stay in town for further questioning. Now, here... (laughs) Yeah. I love... Because you see it in TV and the movies so often. I love that it happens in real life. Yeah. And I, I get it. There are, there are things when you don't have evidence, you don't have evidence. Yeah, but right. I love when the police are like, they really heavily question somebody. Where were you? You built this. Is a body yeah, found? Yeah. All right. Well, don't leave town. Yeah, don't leave town. We're going to have to, we're yeah. going to want to talk to you again. Yeah. Well, what does that say if the person's guilty? Yeah, <laughs> like, especially if they know they're guilty. Right? Shit, I'm out. They're going to get the fuck out of town. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, Mexico, here I come. Right. So, like we discussed, when the police show up at the Christie Hotel on April 19th to continue questioning Speck... He's gone. Yeah, the discovery left the hotel a few hours earlier, carrying his suitcases and saying he was just going to the laundromat. Oh. Well, suitcase. Well, I mean, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> I guess if you don't have a laundry basket. Yeah, I guess, if you don't have the bag. Um, he uh, had instead obviously left town. Yeah. He's out. He's probably uh, Chicago. Yeah. A search of his room uh, turned up a radio and co- costume jewelry uh, that Mrs. Virgil Harris had reported missing, the one who had been raped and burglarized. So he kept a he kept a memento. Yeah. Well, this was like the burglary. He was probably... Yeah. He didn't kill her. Well, I guess rapists he keep raped. mementos, too. Yeah, you're right, yeah. but they still take... I mean, yeah, you want to have something to remember the moment. That's true. Sitting creepily... Serial killers, that's the third thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he also had other reported uh, items that had been reported missing in two other local burglaries oh, okay. the previous month in his hotel room. That's what they find. So I think you called it. Where did he go? Chicago. Chicago. Hey, everybody. Please pardon the interruption while I take a moment to talk about Trailblazer Threads. Now, this is a company that my girlfriend and I started. It's outdoor apparel for RVers, hikers, fishermen, anybody who loves the outdoors. So if you're in the market for a t-shirt or a hoodie to wear on your next adventure, give us a try. Trailblazerthreads.com. Get 10% off with promo code 2MM10. Again, that's trailblazerthreads.com. This is a super cool picture of the Chicago uh, skyline in the 60s. Yep. I love Chicago. I'm from Chicago. Just heads Are up. you really? You knew this. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, so I'm one of the... <laughs> I claim Chicago. 
I was born in Chicago. I was born in Schaumburg. Yeah. Illinois. It was like uh, a suburb. Still, it's um, Schaumburg. And all my family's from up there. A lot of my family's still up there. But I, I was born in like a month after my birth, my family moved to Maybe. rural Iowa. Oh, okay. So I went from being born in the big city to living out in the country. And then like second grade, we moved to Indiana, still country. But you know what I'm saying? But I still claim. I think I can claim being a Chicagoan. Go back all the time. It's where my family's if at. If you're born there, you can claim it. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. I would never want to live there. It's, I, you know, I love going. And I love visiting downtown. Mm-hmm. And, like, the museums are really cool and stuff. I like riding the it L. It is. But I hate the highway. Yeah. I hate the way they drive. Oh, yeah. Because my son lives there, you know, and I hate, I mean, I got to yeah. go see him. Yeah. But I <laughs> hate it. Forced hate, to deal with it. I hate the traffic. I, I mean, just, he's young. He loves it. Oh, Yeah. I mean, he, everything's around. You take the train, you know, the bus. You know, everything's close. He's got a whole network of buddies. Oh yeah. You know, all that went to college together and all that. And they all kind of landed in Chicago. 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 So yeah. you may hear it come out because I say stuff like that. I don't know if you've ever caught that, Mm-mm. like Chicago. Like I kind of have that northern that little. Yeah, got to get to put that plug in there. Yeah. 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 So um, April 19th, 1966, Speck returns to stay with his sister, Martha, in her second floor apartment at 3966 North Avondale Avenue in the old Irving Park neighborhood on the northwest side of Chicago. Now, this is this hits home yeah. because Irving Park is kind of like my one set of my grandparents live there. Okay. Maybe both. I know at least one, you know, that's all that northwest side is yeah. kind of where my family's from. So I read that and I was like, I recognize Avondale Avenue. I was like, oh, oh okay. Uh-oh. Um, so she lives there with her husband, Gene Thornton, and their two teenage daughters. Oh, great. Uh, Martha had worked as a registered nurse in pediatrics before she was married, and her husband, Gene, worked nights as a railroad switchman. Speck told them an unbelievable story about having to leave Monmouth after refusing to sell narcotics for a crime syndicate there. Who is believing there's a crime syndicate in Monmouth, Illinois in 1966? I'm sure her husband was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We yeah, need, we need to get him the f- out of here. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're going to come knocking but, on the door. Right. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's coming. Uh, Gene, uh, who had served in the U.S. Navy, thought that the U.S. Merchant Marine might provide a suitable occupation yes. for his unemployed brother in law and maybe a little, yeah, you know, smack some discipline into him. Yeah. Get him out there on the sea and mm-hmm. work those cargo ships. So on April 25th, he takes Speck to the U.S. Coast Guard office to apply for a letter of authority to work as an apprentice seaman. The application required being fingerprinted and photographed Mm -hmm. and having a physical examination by a doctor. Speck found work immediately after obtaining the letter of authority, joining the 33-member crew of Inland Steel's Clarence B. Randall, which if anybody knows boats, it was an L6 SB1 class bulk or lake freighter. Okay. I I did not know that. I'm guessing it's a just a giant ass boat that carries ore. Yeah. Um Spec smart. Yeah. yeah. Speck's first voyage on the Clarence B was brief since he was stricken with appendicitis on May 3rd. Ooh. And was evacuated by US Co- a US Coast Guard helicopter oh. to St. Joseph's Hospital in Hancock, Michigan. Uh and that's, that bad boy taken out. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. Why do you go to Michigan? Well, that's where the I think where the boat made it that far, and that oh, was okay. the closest. I was gonna say Chicago. Was, Chicago I would think Chicago would be one. Yeah. Well, it's uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, Michigan's the UP oh, upper, Mich- upper, yeah, you know, yeah, upper okay. peninsula. Of course. I think that's where the ship that was probably the closest for them to evacuate him yeah. to, um, and that's where he had an emergency appendectomy. Mm-hmm. That sucks. Yep. After he's discharged from the hospital, Speck returned to stay with his sister Martha and her family in Chicago to recuperate. Which I'm sure her brother, his brother-in-law was like, Shit. like I thought I got his yeah, ass on a boat. He's got his ass on a boat. He's <laughs> back. <laughs> Damn, Damn it. it. Um. So on May 20th, he rejoins the crew of the Clarence B, uh, which is the boat he was evacuated from, okay. until June 14th, when he got drunk and quarreled with one of the boat's officers, and was put ashore That's on a June 15th. No, no. Yeah, you kind of yeah, you don't mess with the officers on that. Yeah. Like. I mean, I know it's not really like the military, but, you know, it's still. But I feel like they, in order to, I mean, obviously these companies, right? Yeah. Like, everyone that's working there is 
prior Navy for the most part. Yeah, probably, yeah. And so they're probably very paramilitaristic, and True. that's that's how you got to run a ship. I mean, you get you got a captain, and you know, like yeah. there's ship's officers. You got to yep. listen to what you're being fucking told. You know, yeah, exactly. The following week after this, after getting fired off the ship, Speck stayed at the St. Elmo, an East Side Chicago flop house at East 99th and Ewing Avenue. Another intersection I, I know. know. Love flop houses. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Speck then traveled by train to Houghton, Michigan, staying at the Douglas House to visit Judy LaCanaimi. Please forgive me, yeah, people. Yeah, we, we don't, yeah. We're going to get into some um, last names that I am going to butcher, I'm sure. So yeah, uh, just yeah. bear with me. She's a 28 year old nurse's aide going through a divorce whom he had befriended at St. Joseph's Hospital while he was having his. Yep. Yep. And on June 27th, after Judy gave him $80 to help him until he found work, Speck left to again stay with his sister, Martha, and her family in Chicago for the next two weeks. So once again, <laughs> this is a raper. That's true. I keep like every time I'm like, oh, so he meets this woman. I'm like, here it comes. Yeah. Here. But I mean, at least he didn't harm her. Which is weird how he can differentiate, you know, some yeah. he's friends with and yeah. it's fine. And then he makes a decision to, to rape guess, others and yeah, attack others, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Weird. Yeah. Um, so here's, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, this is a more modern day picture here. That's just one of the shipyards or one of the ports um, near Chicago, just to give you an idea. Yeah. On June thirtieth, Speck's brother in law Gene. <laughs> Poor Gene, man. Yeah. I feel for yeah, Gene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's take him to another state. So he drives Speck to the National Maritime Union hiring hall. Okay. Uh in the Jeff- Jeffrey Manor na- neighborhood of South Deering, Chicago, to file his paperwork for a Siemens card. The NMU hiring hall was one block east of five attached two-story brick townhouses, three of which were occupied by South Chicago Community Hospital senior student nurses and Filipino exchange registered nurses. Eight of these nurses lived in the easternmost townhouse at 2319 East 100th Street, just 150 feet from the NMU hiring hall. We already know where this is going. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, if you would have just gotten that job, you would have been out in the ocean. Right. Like if he wouldn't have gotten, if he wouldn't have gotten sick or had to have the, you know, appendectomy and all that, then chance number two, he gets drunk, gets thrown off, gets fired, you know, and it's like, dang, all these missed opportunities, opportunities for this not to happen. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, here's that, here's a picture of that, um, that's, that's the house. That's the townhouse there. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably still standing. Yeah. So on uh, July 8th, 1966, Speck's brother-in-law, Gene, drives him to the NMU hiring hall to pick up a Siemens card, register for a berth on a ship. Speck lost out that day to a seaman with more seniority um, on a cargo ship bound for South Vietnam. Man, Gene almost got rid of Speck yeah, for yeah, like a, for ever. Like, how long does it take a ship to get from Chicago to South Vietnam and back? Oh yeah, I, it's going to take a while. Yeah. So where did where do they return to? Back to their apart Martha, sister Martha, and Gene's apartment uh, for the weekend. Yeah. By Monday, July 11th, Speck had outstayed his welcome with his sister Martha and her family. Mm-hmm. They're they're finally they, giving they, up they on this. Was, that wasn't going to take long. Yeah. Yeah. After packing his bags and again being driven by his brother-in-law to the NMU hiring hall to await a berth on a ship, Speck stayed the night at Pauline's rooming house. Does this not sound like a very reputable yeah. establishment? Again, do you want the room for the hour or the night? It's, the pro- week? it's probably one of those, you know, the room doesn't have a bathroom. Mm-hmm. We, we know oh, yeah. some places. Yeah. Not because we... No, we don't hang out. We don't places. hang out there. Just, if we could get into... Yeah. Work stuff, we'd be able to tell you a little bit more, but yeah, um, yeah, no bat, you know, one bathroom for the floor, basically. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like one of those places. So, Pauline's rooming house is about one mile away, um, in the Vets Park neighborhood of South Deering from this, yeah, place. Uh, on Tuesday, July 11th, Speck returned to the hiring hall in mid afternoon. He received an assignment on Sin. Sinclair Oils tanker. Sinclair Oil. That's the dinosaur, right? Yeah. And the little green dinosaur, brontosaurus sure or whatever? Yep. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, so he gets a job on their tanker, the SS Sinclair Great Lakes, which was a 30 minute drive away in East Chicago. When he arrives, he found that his spot had already been taken and he was driven back to the NMU hiring hall. Christ. There's another opportunity missed, right? Man. And by the time he gets back there, the hiring hall's closed. Yep. He doesn't have enough money for a rooming house. So he dropped his bags off six blocks east um, from where he was and slept in an unfinished house just off East 103rd Street. So at this point, he is, um, what do they call it? When you just, you know, there's like an abandoned house. You go and you start. He's homeless. He's uh What do they call that, though? Squatting. Squatter. Yeah, that's, squatter. That's the word yeah. I was looking for. On Wednesday, July 13th, Speck picked up his bags and checked in at the NMU hiring hall once again. Okay. He was angry for being sent to a non-existent assignment the day before, and he and he uh, talked for 30 minutes in the car with his sister, Martha, and her husband, Gene, who had driven down to visit him at 9 a.m. Now, see, this I'm confused about. They're pissed off, and they kick him out, but they're still like, check. I mean, it's your brother, I yeah, guess. Yeah, it's your brother, yeah. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. He's still family. Yeah. Even though he's a piece of shit. Right. But he's still family. Right. Yeah. I mean, they see where he's going. Yeah, I, I think people in these situations, and I don't know, I don't have any members of my no, family. No, I don't either, but I would assume that. I feel like you would know, like after a murder happens, I, th- I f- almost feel like you would have that like, ah, yeah. I kind of figured, yeah. you know, like it was heading that way. Yeah. So when they get down there to visit him, they park on East 100th Street next to Luella Elementary School and across the street from the townhouses where the nurses live. Okay. At 10.30 a.m., Speck was tired of waiting at the NMU hiring hall for a job. He had $25 that his sister had just given to him, and he left and walked about a mile and a half east on 100th Street to check in at the Shipyard Inn at uh, 101st and South Avenue North. Okay, well, at least they got an inn. Right? Well, at least, and he's got the 25 but at least they got a place to stay, yeah. right? Um, so this is just another, like, east side Chicago rooming house, basically, yeah. though, so nothing. I wonder what the room rate was for the night. I know. I wish I didn't come across that. Like $2.50? Yeah, $2.50 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Speck spent the rest of the day drinking in nearby taverns before he accosted Ella May Hooper at Knife Point. Here we go again. She's a 53-year-old woman who had spent the day drinking at the same taverns that Speck had been patronizing. Speck took her to his room at the Shipyard Inn, raped her, stole her black $16 mail-order twenty two caliber pistol, Oh, there we go. Now he's armed. Now we got a gun. Uh, He then left dressed entirely in black, armed with a switchblade and LMA Hooper's handgun. Uh, And after dinner at nearby K Pilot House, Speck returned to drink at the Shipyard Inn's Tavern until about 10.20 p.m. He walked about a mile and a half west on 100th, uh, East 100th Street, to the nurse's townhouse. He went directly there. Located at 2319 East on 100th Street. So he cased the joint out already. Yeah. He's, he's been casing it. He's, uh, that's what I think. Yeah. I mean, I don't think they ever find evidence of that, but. I mean, I mean, yeah, you had to have. You've been by this place numerous days now at yeah. that hall. Like, how do you know to walk there? You, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, you, you're right. Yeah, he's had to check. Yeah. Exactly. At 11 p.m. on July 13th, 1966. Speck broke into the 2319 East 100 Street townhouse in Chicago's Jeffrey Manor neighborhood. The townhouse was functioning as a dormitory for student nurses. He entered and using only a knife, killed Gloria Jean Davy, age of 22, Suzanne Bridget Ferris, age 21, Morlita Ornato Gargula, age 23, Mary Ann Jordan, age 20, Patricia Ann Matusik, age 20, Valentina P. Passion, age 24, Nina Jo Schmel, age 24, and Pamela Lee Wilkering, age 20. So eight. Yeah. Um, Speck, who later claimed he was both drunk and high on drugs, may have originally planned to commit a routine burglary. Speck um, held the women in a room for hours, leading them one by one and stabbing or strangling each of them to death then finally raping and strangling his last victim, 22-year-old Gloria Davy. Intervals between um, 20 and 30 minutes elapsed for each murder, so, which is crazy. So 
he's he's holding these eight women and he takes the first one and yeah. murders her. And they're saying that they believe that there was a 20 to 30 minute interval between each one. So everyone, the other seven are sitting there. Yeah. Hearing what's going on, not being able to escape. Correct. And he comes back in and gets the next one. And he's just slow. Like, I just can't imagine sitting in that room, especially no. being the eighth. Oh, like, yeah. I just can't imagine. Yeah. I really can't. Um, one woman, and I, I'm sorry I'm going to mess this name up, Corazon Amurao, escaped death. And this is her picture there. Uh, she escaped death because she crawled and hid under a bed while Speck was out of the room. Oh, okay. Speck possibly lost count or might have known eight women lived in the townhouse, but was unaware that a ninth was spending the night. Oh, okay. okay. Amuro stayed hidden until almost 6 a.m. Um, Amura and two of the murder victims, Gargula and Passion, were exchange nurses from the Philippines. So she is the, the lone survivor here in this incident. And she had to hear all that. Yeah. And, and probably knew what was. Oh, they had to have known what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Two days after the murders, Speck was identified by a drifter named Claude Lunsford. Speck, Lunsford, and another man had been drinking the evening of July 15th on the fire escape of the Star Hotel at 617 West Madison. So here's a picture of the Star Hotel. This is gone now. They've leveled this whole block, and there's a... um, I think I said the presidential towers. Oh, okay. It's a, bit, it's a nicer, probably high rise there. Yeah. But I just, <laughs> I just love this part of the side. The big advertisement for the Star Hotel is fireproof rooms. Oh yeah. I mean, I get there's a the big hmm. Chicago fire, but true. But it's just funny that this, the fight. That's the big not air conditioning or yeah, yeah. running water or flushing well, they, toilets. They survived the fire. It's. <laughs> Right. And they're not really fireproof. They just survived the fire. Right. You know, the fire may have stopped like maybe next door. So fi- they can claim fireproof just yeah. because it didn't burn down. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Um, so on July 16th, Lunsford recognized a sketch of the murderer in the evening paper and phoned the police at 9.30 p.m. after finding Speck uh, in his room of the Star Hotel. So, you know, at this point, we've got the survivor. True. She knows what he looks like. They've made a sketch. And now... Here, you know, two days later, this, you know, room, you know, or I guess a guy in another room of the hotel that's also a drinker that they're hanging out. Yeah, yeah. He's like, uh, I think I know that guy, you know. Yeah, how much money is there? Right, exactly. Um, The police, however, did not respond to the call. Oh. Although their records showed the call had been made. Speck then attempted suicide and the Star Hotel. I, I know, right? Rather than face. Yeah. You, we see that a lot. Yeah, you're man, man enough to do it. You should be man enough to take the, take the punishment for it. Well, just exactly. There, yeah, I think they're all cowards. Uh, the Star Hotel desk clerk phoned in the emergency around midnight. Speck was taken to Cook County Hospital at 12.30 a.m. on July 17th. And at the hospital, Speck was recognized by Dr. Leroy Smith, a 25-year-old surgical resident physician, who had read about the Born to Raise Hell tattoo in the newspaper story. She identified tattoos on his body, too. Uh, the police were called, and Speck was finally arrested. You know, cause back then, tattoos were were not that common, unless you were like a military guy. True, true, right. So easily identifiable. I mean, yeah, you've done some jail time. Because now it's like, oh, the guy had a sleeve of tattoos, yeah, that'd be easy to figure out who that is. Yeah. Right. Concerns over the recent Miranda decision that had vacated the convictions of a number of criminals meant Speck was not even questioned for three weeks after his arrest, he says. Wow. Because I think they were trying to figure out what's going yeah. on with Miranda, yeah. you know. Um, this, by the way, is uh, Dr. Leroy Smith. Oh. He's the one that recognized him from the papers when he came in after the suicide attempt and said, hey, I think I should probably call the cops. Oh, now he looks like that. That's what a doctor should look like. Right? Yeah. That's that's like the poster for a TV show. Sure is. Yeah. Yep. Speck later claimed he had no recollection of the murders. Of course not. He had confessed the crime to Dr. Smith at the Cook County Hospital. Smith did not testify because the confession was made while Speck was sedated. Oh, yeah, you can't. Yeah. It kind of messes things up. Uh, Illinois Supreme Court Justice John J. Stamos, Cook County State Attorney, when Speck was tried, who knew of the hospital confession, stated, quote, we didn't need it, 
we had eyewitnesses. Okay. Yeah. Which makes I mean that Tattoo makes sense. And well, and you've got the surviving yeah, survivor who's gonna there. say, "Yeah, that's, hey, the, that's the guy." Yeah, I'm sure his face is just burned in her memory. Oh, I'm sure. I can't, I can't even imagine going through something yeah. like that. Um, Speck confessed to the murders for the first time in public when he spoke to Chicago Tribune columnist Bob Green in '78. So this is after he's convicted. This is the first time he confesses, and he does it in a film that the inmates made at Statesville Correctional Center in <laughs> 1988. Speck recounted the brutal murders in detail. He again stated he was high that night. Of course. But then he undercut the idea that the drugs were a mitigating factor, asserting that he could just have well, quote, done it sober. Jackass. I mean, what was he high on? Marijuana? I, I don't know. Because, I mean, it, seriously. <laughs> it doesn't drive you to... No. It makes you want to eat Doritos. Exactly. And sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're going to get into Speck's trial and imprisonment, which if you thought the crime was crazy, which I think is, that's pretty crazy. It is. I mean, for one guy to... Eight nurses. Take, yeah, take down eight people. Out of nowhere. Well, for him, I think it wasn't out of nowhere. Yeah, but, yeah. Premeditated. But if you thought that was nuts, wait till you hear about this trial and his time in prison. Oh, great. But first, we got something important to do. Okay. Do you know what it is? What we got to do? Oh. Wheel of Death. It's the Wheel of Death. There we go. It's, it's, uh, hypnotism. <laughs> I'm getting dizzy. I'm getting dizzy. All right. Do we have somebody? We don't, man. I wish we did. We're going to have to start calling friends and relatives to get this thing going. Yeah. But we'll, we'll just explain it to you since it is our first episode. Then everybody will know what it is. So this here's the Wheel we, of Death. Do we have any comment or anything on anything? Do we have any comments anywhere? Yeah, we have comments. But people said, you know, great show. Looks good. Let's maybe the first person to comment. Oh, maybe. Hit them up, see if they want to participate. Yeah, it's kind of late to do that, though. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. We'll, we'll, fi- we'll Future episodes, it. we'll figure this we'll out. We'll figure it out. So the way this is supposed to work um, is on our website, to murdermorons.com. Um, if you go to our about section, you'll see where it says wheel of death Wheel of death. And there is a sign up form there where you just enter your name, your phone number, your email. We yep. don't sell it to anybody. It's just to sign up for this. And every week we will randomly draw one of those people and you can be a call in guest on the show. Um, you know, over the phone, over FaceTime if you want, and then we can show yeah, you. Yeah, we show you up on the screen On here. the Jumbotron up there. Yep. Um, and we'll spin the wheel of death for you and whatever you land on you get. Hopefully it's not one of the dust spots. But what we got on here? We got death. Jumbotron. What? Jumbotron. Really? Ju- it's not even a, it's a 32 inch TV. I was trying to hype it up. Mike. Okay. All right. I, and I think it's a 29 okay. to be technical. Um, what we got on here? We got death, which obviously you don't win. Yep. Shit. Um, we got gift cards to our merch store. Yep. We got hoodies. Got we got hoodies. shirts. We got hats. hats. Mike, yep. Mike is got the hat. wearing the hat right now. Um, we also have um, free memberships to buy me a coffee. So we'll, if you land on this, you'll get a free yep, free membership. membership, and then you'll get all the bonus episodes. Yep. So, um, you know, we played this on our first bonus episode that we recorded last week. We did. Um, so I'm, I, I want to extend the same offer to you because what we did last time is, is Mike got to spin it and whatever he won, I was going to provide to him if it was something cool. I got death, by the way. Yeah, he he got screwed. He got death. Yeah, so, uh, which there's only four. I don't know how many total are on there, like total spaces, but there's only four death spaces. Only four, yeah. So, <laughs> you have a better chance of winning something than not somehow True. you land on death. Yeah, death. That's just my luck. So let's see if you can land on death again. Give it a spin, and we'll pretend like someone's called in, and this is what you would have won if you would have signed up. I did. Here, let me do it. You? Again. No, no, no. Death. Two days in a row? Dude, there's four death spaces. I might be dead. Dude, something's going on. I may not be here next time. What's going to happen is when we do get people to sign up, they're going to be like, we want Andy to spend exactly. it. Exactly. We don't, don't want, want Mike, Mike spending yep. it. Yep. But let me do it again. Hold okay. on. Let me be give, a, give a good one. Dude, I promise this thing isn't rigged. I know this probably looks like Vegas right now. <laughs> Did you, you, you spin it. <laughs> you spin it. You spin it. This is Are you going to give me whatever I land on? Sure. Okay, here we go. 
See, I would have won a Wheel of Death t-shirt, which we will show on the screen right now so everybody can see what it looks like. Oh, he's frustrated. He's playing until he wins. Wheel of Death t-shirt. That We both have a Wheel of Death t-shirt now. We'll have to wear yeah. them. We can be matchy-matchy on, on, on one right. episode. Cool. Okay, so that, friends, is a Wheel of Death. Um, if you want to sign up, here is the link. It's to murder. I, I'm going to have so much trouble saying her name. Murder. Murder. To murdermorons.com slash wheel of death. Or if you're watching our show, scan the QR code on your screen. It'll take you straight to the sign up form. Cool. Should we jump cool. right back in? Yeah, let's jump right back let's, in. Let's jump into the Keep jury. Plugging. Keep plugging. Plug it away. Here's Specs showing up. No. I, I love the old school. <laughs> Here, I'm going to handcuff him to me because he's not going to do nothing. <laughs> Let's handcuff him. That's that's yeah, let's, like let's, Dick Tracy stuff yeah, right let's there. Just leave the other hand free, right? Or yeah. I mean, I don't want my wrist broken. No, I, like I, exactly. But that's how they did things back then. Yeah, it is Chicago. So his trial begins April third, nineteen sixty seven, in Peoria, three hours southwest of Chicago, uh, with a gag order on the press. Judge oh. put a gag order on the press. Okay, that's good. In court, Speck was positively identified by the sole surviving student nurse, Corazan Amaral. When Amaral was asked if she could identify the killer of her fellow students, Amaral rose from her seat in the witness box, walked directly in front of Speck, pointed her finger at him, nearly touching him, and said, this is the man. Wow. So that I would took some uh, took some nerves there. Well, that took some balls on her part. Yeah. But how badass yeah. is that? Yep. I mean, doing it for your friends, you know. Yep. Well, she's got eight people to. Yeah. Uh, in addition, Lieutenant Emil Guise testified that fingerprints at the scene had been matched to spec. Okay. So they've got the well, eyewitness, they got the fingerprints. Yep. On April 15th, after just 49 minutes of deliberation, <laughs> the jury found spec guilty and rec- recommended the death penalty. So this is a death penalty case. They only delivered under an hour to come back that he should be put to death. I mean, they just went back there and were like, <laughs> they have a sandwich or something? Probably. Let's have a sandwich and we'll go back out filled and up their, yeah. Filled up their coffee mugs. And yeah, had a beer. <laughs> yeah. On June 5th, Judge Herbert J. Passion sent Inspect to die in the electric chair, <laughs> but granted an immediate stay pending automatic appeal, which is kind of what we which do. Which is normal, yeah. The Illinois Supreme Court subsequently upheld his convici- conviction and death sentence on November 22nd, 1968. Good. This is a Ooh. cool color photo yeah, of him there in court. Nasty. He's scary looking at this point. He has some serious uh, acne issues. Yeah. Let's bring it up so they can see there. What a gentleman. He's got the... At least he showed up in a shirt and tie. That's true. Yeah. That's true. All right, on June 28th, 1971, the U.S. Supreme Court, citing their June 3rd, 68, Witherspoon versus Illinois decision, upheld Speck's conviction but reversed his death sentence. Of course. Right? Yeah. Because more than 250 potential jurors were unconstitutionally excluded from his jury because of their conscientious or religious beliefs against capital punishment. I remember this being a big, I mean, I obviously wasn't alive at the time, but yeah. studying it yeah. being a big thing. The case was remanded back to the Illinois Supreme Court for resentencing. On June 29th of 72, in Furman versus Georgia, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the death penalty unconstitutional. So the Illinois Supreme Court's only option was to order spec resentenced to prison by the original Cook County Court. On November 21st, 1972, in Peoria, Judge Richard Fitzgerald resentenced spec to 400 to 1,200 years in prison. <laughs> Jesus. Eight consecutive sentences of 50 to 150 years, which was then reduced to 100 to 300 years. He was... Uh, at least he had a chance. <laughs> of what? Living into 150? I mean, maybe. You never know. He, he would have led a clean life, maybe. Oh, you think he's... <laughs> he's turned around at this point? No, no. Um... He was denied parole in seven minutes at his first parole hearing on September 15, 1976. Wonder why. And at six subsequent hearings in 77, 78, 81, 84, 87, and 1990. I wonder why. I mean, he's an old man. He's still, I mean, he's still dangerous. Yeah. 
This is him. Uh, look at him. Yeah. Well, I mean, he looks psycho. Like, what's he staring at? He's got a tattoo on him, too. Look well, there's tattoo. that tattoo that tattoo. probably got him identified. Well, that's a different one. It looks like a leg. It looks like a snake wrapped around something, doesn't it? Yeah, something. Like oh. a, hmm. While incarcerated at Statesville Correctional Facility in Crest Hill, Illinois, Speck was given the nickname Birdman after the film Birdman of Alcatraz. Okay. Because he kept a pair of sparrows that flew into his cell. Okay. He was described as a loner who kept a stamp collection and enjoyed listening to music. So here we go back to reverting back to our days and his younger days when he was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like that childlike state almost. Yep. Uh, his contacts with the warden included requests for new shirts, a radio, and other mundane items. The warden merely described him as, quote, a big nothing doing time. Oh. Isn't that pretty much all of them? Well, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, granted, some do, they work, or they go to school. Or, or they cause problems. Or they cause problems. Right. Yeah. So I think he's saying, like, this dude's born, like, he doesn't yeah. do anything, doesn't cause trouble, he doesn't, you know, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Speck, however, was not a model prisoner. Yeah, we know that. He was often caught with drugs or distilled moonshine, uh, but punishment for these infractions never stopped him. He said once, quote, how am I going to get in trouble? I'm here for 1,200 years. Yeah. Yeah, what are they going to do to him? Yeah, what are they going to add a year to it? Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. it? Yeah. Well, they added five days to it. Holy shit, what am I going to do? <laughs> Crap, damn it. Now I'm never going to get down here. Messed up my whole life Damn it, now. it took five more days to get him to realize that he's not coming out here. <laughs> Speck loathed reporters and granted only one press interview in 1978 to Chicago Tribune columnist Bob Green. During that interview, he publicly confessed to the murders okay. for the first time. At least he did that. At least he admitted it. And said he thought he would get out of prison, quote, between now and the year 2000. Why he thought that, I don't know. At which time he hoped to run his own grocery store business. Oh, really? So his plan. So he was going to get out with no money <laughs> and run places that he used to rob right. consistently. Well, clearly he knows how to sell cigarettes. Oh, true. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, then the pro- one of the primary. Well, he should grocery- open up one of those little marts then. Well, a smoke shop. A little Dagobah yeah. corner market or something. Yeah. Uh, when the reporter asked him if he compared himself to celebrity killers like John Dillinger, Speck replied, quote, me? I'm not like Dillinger or anybody else. I'm freakish. End quote. He is freakish. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Speck stated that at the time of the killings, he, quote, had no feelings, but things had changed. He said, I had no feelings at all that night. They said there was blood all over the place. I can't remember. It felt like nothing. I'm sorry as hell for those girls and for their families and for me. If I had to do it over again, it would be a simple house burglary. Speck's, quote, final thought for the American people was, just tell them to keep up their hatred for me. I know it keeps up their morale, and I don't know what I'd do without it. Ah, hey, there you go. That's a stand-up man. (laughs) You know what, though? We, um, our bonus episode which you can listen to now. Yeah. So we did the famous uh, 15 famous quotes from people Correct. on death row. And and we bitched about like why these people said this crazy yeah, instead of apologizing. Yeah, exactly. At least this, I mean, he, he kind of has the weird thing at the end there, but for the most part, I mean, he said, I'm sorry as hell for what I did to those girls and their family. You know, he which, actually apologized. Yeah. Whether he meant it or not. Right. I'm I mean, sure the family thought it was bull. I'm sure. But it's better than saying something like deny, deny, deny. Right. It wasn't me. Exactly. Well, I don't remember doing it. You know who John Douglas is? Mm-mm. FBI, behavioral. Oh, those are the ones that interviewed him. Oh, yes. Yes. In his book, Mindhunter, Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit, John E. Douglas of the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit refers to a telling prison incident Speck revealed to him in an interview. So for those of you that aren't aware... Uh, Actually, there's a great show. Is it on Netflix yeah. called Mindhunter yep. or Mindhunters? Mindhunters. It was the startup of their, basically their serial crime. Yeah, their behavioral science yeah. unit, basically. And they yeah. go around and interview. I mean, it's all real life. Yeah, it's um, all true. You know, who they, Manson and this guy, you know, all the this son guy, of Sam. Yeah. 
anybody that was a anybody trying, that was considered a serial killer. Yeah, to basically try and figure out what makes them tick and yep. what makes them a serial killer. Mm-hmm. So he interviews Speck, and Speck tells him in his interview that he once found an injured sparrow that had flown in through one of the broken windows, and Speck had nursed it back to health. When it was healthy enough to stand, he tied a string around its leg and had it perch on a shoulder. And at one point, a guard told him that pets weren't allowed. Oh, okay. Speck said to the guard, I can't have it. And uh, then he walked over to a spinning fan and threw the bird into it. Oh. Which made the bird, you know, yeah. explode into a million pieces. Yeah. Horrified, the guard said, I thought you liked that bird. And Speck's response was, I did, but if I can't have it, no one can. Wow. Kind of tells you a little bit. So there's his mindset for his murder. Right. Now here, now this is the, this, this part of it's crazy to me. If it isn't already. Uh, Yeah. In May, 1996, Chicago television news anchor, Bill Curtis received videotapes that had been made at Statesville Correctional Center in 1988 from an anonymous attorney showing them publicly for the first time before the Illinois state legislature, Curtis pointed out the explicit scenes of sex, drug use, and money being passed around by prisoners who seemingly had no fear of being caught. And in the center of all this is Speck performing oral sex on another inmate, sharing a large quantity of cocaine with another inmate, uh, parading in silk panties, sporting female-like breasts, which were allegedly grown using smuggled hormone treatments oh. and boasting, quote, if they only knew how much fun I was having, they'd turn me loose. Wow. That's all. I bet he was tossing a lot of salad. <laughs> wow, Mike. Yeah. I had to go there. <laughs> you just had to. Just huh? had to. Just had to. Just had to. For those of you that don't know what that means, look it up. I oh, thought you were going to go into it. No, I was like, I'm please not going don't. No, no, no. Google it. <laughs> yeah. Google it when you're not at work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not what you think. Yeah. The uh, Illinois legislature packed the auditorium to view the two hour video, but stopped the screening when the tape showed Speck performing oral sex on another man. That's all they, they could um, stand to watch. This, by the way, that I have up here, this is like a, a gra- So I found the video. Oh, okay. I could have played portions of the video. Yeah. It's so bad, though, I was afraid we'd get strikes. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. we'd get kicked off YouTube or Spotify or something. True, which, because true. some of it is, uh, it's insane. And you can see, that is spec on the left, a much older spec. Yeah. Um, and you can see there that he does have some breasts. Mm-hmm. They're sagging down pretty low. Yeah. Like, well, he's old, so true. he's got the old lady yeah, yeah, boobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't have a brawl. Yeah. Um, so during this, inter- almost like an interview type setting from behind the camera, a prisoner, because it's the prisoners that made this yeah. video, supposedly, um, asks Speck if he had killed the nurses. And Speck responded, sure I did. And when asked why, Speck shrugged and jokingly said, wasn't their night. It's kind of an ass. Yeah. When, after apologizing, yeah. now you're going to make a comment like that. Uh, I mean, he's been in... Forever, so I mean. Yeah. When asked how he felt about himself in the years since the murders, he said, quote, like I always felt, had no feeling. If you're asking me if I felt sorry, no. So he was full of shit before. Yeah, no remorse. He also described in detail the experience of strangling someone, saying, it's not like TV. It takes over three minutes, and you have to have a lot of strength. Uh, Yeah. And he did it eight times. Yeah, back to back. Yeah. Like, yeah. Here's oh, one wow, of his. That's a big change. It's one of his final uh, prison photos here. So shortly uh, before December 5th, 1991, Speck was transported from Statesville Correctional Center to Silver Cross Hospital in Julia, Illinois, after complaining of severe chest pains. Speck later died in the early morning hours of December 5th of what was believed to be a heart attack, one day shy of what would have been his 50th birthday. Now, I don't know about you. He looks older than 50. He looks way yeah. older than 50. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm early 50, and I look great. You're older than he is in that picture, yeah. and you look probably 20 years younger than... Oh, thank you. Let's let's do well, a little... 
Here's the Let's uh, let, oh. look in the uh, look in your camera over here, Mike. This is a mic spec. Mike spec. Okay, I'd agree. You're you're better looking. Okay, I'll, thank get, you. I'll give that to you. I appreciate that. <laughs> The coroner stated the spec had an enlarged heart, emphysema, and clogged arteries. Oh, I wonder why. <laughs> which most likely contributed to his heart yeah, attack. Yeah, yeah. Speck's sister feared that his grave would be desecrated. I think that's a va- very probably, valid yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. So he was cremated and his ashes were scattered in an undisclosed location in the Joliet area. Okay. I mean, they could have oh. put him in a prison grave. I don't... I think... I don't know if they do that anymore. I don't think they do. I don't the 60s? Yeah, I don't know. Are we past that in the 60s? Well, was, well, you didn't die till the 90s, though. Oh, so we're de- you're right. We're definitely past yeah, that. I don't definitely know what I'm thinking. Yeah, we're, yeah. They're not doing yeah. yeah. So that's Richard Speck. We got we got through it. Man. We got through him. We got through it. He's a... Uh, he's... He's he's definitely he's a very interesting character. He is, and you know, obviously, I think a whole series could be done in more detail just about his life. And just and you know, if he wouldn't have been caught, it's to I mean, just to think how many how many victims he would have had before he got caught. There has to be something. I mean, he had. I mean, he didn't just go from just raping women. There has to be. I, I just, in my opinion. There's got to be some that he's probably not. They haven't tagged to him yet, maybe. Right, that we don't know. Well, we know about. We just don't know it was him. Yeah, you know, missing people or bodies that have been uh, found. Yeah, or, yeah, unsolved and probably never will be. But yeah, yeah, it just seems like it's a. He took a hell of a jump. Yeah, well, especially we had a couple of those cases, like the. Yeah. You know, they found the jewelry and stuff later. It was like, well, how many others? Yeah, that we you know that those two we almost didn't catch him. You know, we're assuming he did he did it. Yeah, true. I mean, he had their, but how many other did he have stuff and pawn it or? Yeah, we just you're right. I think there's probably more victims out probably. there. I don't think this was his first rodeo as far as no, goes. that's a lot of people. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah. Well. On a lighter note, let's talk real quick. If you enjoyed this episode yeah. and uh, you want to uh, support the show, we talked about it a little bit before, buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons is a great place to do that. You can simply buy Mike and I a coffee, or you can sign up to be a member for exclusive benefits, including bonus episodes, which yes. we've got one up there. I'm pretty sure by the time this airs and anyone's listening to it, there'll be three or four. Yeah, it should be, if, yeah. So um, there's a couple episodes on there waiting for you to listen to. So head to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. So you want to say it quick. I'm good. Good. Uh, to learn more. Um, if you're a Spotify user, you can also subscribe to the paid subscription um, on Spotify and also get access yep. uh, to those b- bonus episodes. And uh, like we mentioned before, merch store, another great way to support us. Uh, you can grab some of our merch items on our website. Uh, that way you can support the show and help us get the word out yep. about the show. Um, that's to murdermorons.com. You're right. Slash merch. You got it. Or oh, scan yeah. the QR code. Um that's on your screen. Yeah. See, see what we have to offer. I think we got some we got some cool stuff up there. I think so. Yeah. So depending on how you listen or watch the show, don't forget to follow, like, like subscribe. subscribe. That's the free way to support us. Yes. I mean, that's especially like if you're on YouTube, Spotify, give us a like. Yeah. Drop us a comment. We respond to those. Yep. Um, subscribe to us so you get notified when we release a new episode. That, you yeah. know, help pump the algorithm and help our show get pass, sent pass out the word. There. Yeah. Let people know we're out here. Yeah. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about deaths at Disney. Oh, so yeah, you want to tune in? Uh, so we're we're kind of diverting from the true crime a little bit, okay? Um, because none of them are really like crimes, but there are some pretty brutal, crazy, gruesome deaths that have happened, and we're there have been so many that we're just going to focus on Disney World in Florida. Holy! If we totaled up all Disney parks in all of time they've existed. It, it, it's they a whole keep that, they keep that quiet. Well, they have to report certain things. We'll get into that on the show, though, okay. and, how, and how that stuff works. But definitely tune in next week, next Wednesday, when we release deaths at Disney. I saw a video on Facebook of Minnie Mouse smoking a cigarette. What? How? Head, he, head off? Yep. Okay. So not literally like through the mask. No. Head was... Like the head, the head... But out in the park, just kind of like hid behind a tree as people were walking by him. It was a man. Like someone like is it recent? No, it looked pretty old. Oh, like from seventies or yeah, something, probably. like something old, seventies, something yeah. like that. Yeah, 
Interesting. I'm going to have to look that I'll up. I'll find now. it and show and, it to you. And we'll show it on the next. Yeah. Yeah, I found it kind of weird. <laughs> next up. So, uh, well, guys, thanks for tuning in to the first episode. Yeah. Um, hope you liked it. Hope you liked it. Join us for more. We'll be back with more. Yep. We'll see you. All right. See you guys. Bye. Peace.